Alrighty guys, welcome back, welcome back. This is your host, ID Jester. Alright, so here we are with our Panzer Grenadier. And uh, you can see we are in Vassal, so I've got it so that <clears throat> hopefully it'll be a little bit easier on your eyes to see and uh, be able to uh, understand the game concepts again here in Panzer Grenadier. So uh, let's get to it here. So let's uh, go over just a few things, um, kind of important things here. So I've got a little scenario set up here so for some Germans and the Americans. Germans have to uh, take over this town and maybe kick the Germans or the Americans out of the hexes down here. And so uh, that is the, the general setup of what's the scenario. And I, you know, put units in different locations so we can kind of talk about some things. So. All right, so we talked about some of the units. So if we look at these Grin units up here, Grenadiers, they have a firepower of six, a range of three. So the big number on the left, on the bottom left-hand corner, the number on the left, the six, is its firepower. After the dash is its range. Up at the top right-hand corner is a littler three, and that is its movement points. Uh, leaders, if we look at this leader here, Lieutenant, Nine in circle is his morale. Then he's going to have two triangles down at the bottom. The bottom left is his combat factors. The bottom right is his morale modifier. Uh, and uh, so if we look at his armor fighting vehicle, this Stug 4 there. So again, down in the bottom left hand corner, 10 5 is his firepower. His direct attack firepower and his range of five. In the bottom right hand corner in the red with the orange background. Six is his firepower. Eight is his range. This is going to be his AT attack value. Up in the top right hand corner again. Eight is its firepower or its uh, movement points. And then kind of uh, in the front facing of it that five in the red box with the orange number is its armor value. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. All right, so that's kind of a breakdown of the units again. Uh, oh, one more here. We have a 81 millimeter mortar. It has down in the bottom left-hand corner, 8-10. That is its direct, indirect firepower bombardment value. So firepower of 8 and a range of 10 up in the top right hand corner is a one, which is again, his movement points. All right, so, all right, so what are we gonna talk about first? Let's talk about scenarios. So, um, you know, we talked about disrupted, we talked about demoralized. Disrupted is kind of your first level of becoming an ungood unit. So you're disrupted, you're, you know, hunkering down, you're, afraid of what's going on, demoralized, you're panicked, you're in a state of shock, uh, you're not able to do anything, you can't think straight. So obviously uh, demoralized is much worse than uh, disrupted. So uh, right, and then of course the units have step values, so this is a full step unit if we Let's see. Um, a flip. There we go. So now it's as half fire firepower um, as it's a now a half squad. So let's flip it back. There we go. All right. So that's kind of that. So let's talk about scenarios. So how? Um, notice we we haven't talked about morale. We've talked about morale, but we haven't actually seen any morale values on any counters. Um, except for the leaders. So how do we actually know what our morale is? There's no information on the counters. Well, that's where the actual scenario comes in. So I ended up finding this uh, scenario here that someone had created uh, that kind of mimics what happens in the normal avalanche press. So normally you'll get the 
title of the scenario and then you'll get some um, information about the forces and what had happened and all that and then you'll usually have some kind of information about the mini map it'll show you the mini maps that you need and the positioning of the mini maps it'll talk about the game turn length and it'll talk about the time the battle starts what time it is so this would be 1700 or five o'clock in the evening uh, it might give you some other information and then it'll start listing the uh, different signs that fought in this battle what kind of units they are going to get any kind of reinforcements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it also have important information, and that would be your morale for the units. In this case, morale eight slash eight. It'll also have your initiative number. So in this case, it would be a two, and any offboard artillery for that unit. In this case, he has one factor of twelve firepower. Okay, so this is where you're going to get your morale for all the units that are not your leaders that have printed morale. And the reason there are two numbers there is one is full strength and one is when they are at half strength. So at full strength, they are uh, eight. And if they're reduced, then they will, in this case, it also be an eight. And, of course, another important number is 2 for the initiative order. We're going to talk about that in just a moment here. If we go to the other side here, we can see there's elements of the 32nd Rifle Division, information about that side, what counters, and, again, the morale. So, in this case, full-strength units have a morale of 7, and half-strength units have a morale of 6, and they have an initiative of 4, and then again, any off-board artillery. Then you will have any special rules that go along with that scenario. And then the victory conditions, how to win. And then the conclusion of what historically happened in that situation. So this is the, pretty much the breakdown of any scenario in Panzer Grenadier. Again, kind of an intro to the scenario. Intro information about the maps, the game turn, the length, the starting time. And it'll start introducing you to the different units. Make sure you notice the morale and the initiative for each side, because that will be important. And then it'll list the other side, all their weapons and units and everything, their morale and their initiative, and then any special rules. And then finally, victory conditions and a conclusion. So that's where we're going to actually find the morale. So it's important to, to know that information back and forth. Now, inside of the Vassal program, there's actually a way, or here it is, to keep track of that information. So we're going to assume in this scenario the Americans have an initiative of two, the Germans have an initiative of four, and uh, we're going to assume that this scenario starts at 10 o'clock in the morning, I will just say 7 o'clock so I don't have to click that many times. And it's, uh, say, 20 turns long. And uh, there is no way to keep track of the morale, which is interesting in Vassal. But we're going to assume the Germans have a morale of 8 on the front and 7 on the back. And the Americans are going to be 7 and 7. All right? So we'll just... We'll just you know that's that'll be our scenario in our head as we as we as we go through this. So how do we actually uh, do initiative? So it's important. Every game turn starts with an initiative roll. You're going to each side is going to roll a six-sided dice, and they're going to add your level of initiative to it, and then you're going to get your total, and then you're going to compare those two totals, and the side that rolls higher gets to take the first activation and in fact the side that <clears throat> has the higher total divides their um, total at uh, it, uh, see how do I how do I explain this the side that wins the initiative uh, the difference between the two initiative roles they divide that number by two and round up and that's how many activations they can actually take so Let's give a couple examples here. So 
Uh, we'll roll for the uh, Germans here. So we're going to add four to this. So the Germans rolled a six plus a four is a ten. The Americans have a plus two. They roll a six-sided dice. So it's five plus two is seven. So the Germans ended up with ten. The Americans ended up with seven. The difference between those is three. So half of three is 1.5. You round that up to two. So the Germans can basically take two activations to start this turn. And then the American will take his first activation and they'll go back and forth and back and forth until both players pass consecutively and then that will be it. So let's give you another example. Let's say we're at the end of the next turn and the Germans roll a 1 plus 4 is 5. The Americans roll 6 plus 2 is 8. So the Germans roll 5, the Americans rolled 8. Again, the difference is 3 between them. This time the Americans have the advantage, and they divide the 3 by 2, and you get 1.5. So they round it up, that is 2 activations. So the Americans can take 2 activations to start this turn before the Germans can actually jump in and get their first activation. So that's how the initiative works in Panzer Grenadier happens every turn just like that. If you end up tied, uh, let's say we end up with both uh, both sides getting eight for some reason. Uh, at that point, you would then re-roll it until one side has the initiative over the other. And of course, uh, let's say the Germans end up having a total of seven and the Americans had a total of six. The difference between that is one. You divide one in half is 0.5. You round that up to one. So in that case, it will just be one activation uh, before the other side could go. So in that case, if it ends up, say, eight to seven, the Germans would get one activation. So you don't necessarily get extra activations. You do have to beat your opponent's initiative by more than Two to get a bonus on your uh, on your initiative for the turn. Okay, so that is that. All right, so let's talk about stacking. So stacking is very important. So I think we mentioned this last time, but I'm going to mention it again. So stacking in this game is basically you can have three combat units, whether they are foot units or uh, armored fighting vehicles or weapon teams or whatever they are three combat units basically can stack in a hex and um, I'm actually going to show you the rule because it's it's not confusing but it's probably best if I just you know show you what it says so the maximum number of units that can occupy a hex is three combat units plus three transports, which includes APCs. So APCs are special units in um, Panzer Grenadier in that they uh, count as combat units and they also count as non... They don't count against your stacking limit uh, until you have more than three of them. So you can have uh, three units, a combat units plus three transport units, and inside these tr three transport units, each one of them might have a, um, a unit uh, that they're transporting. So three transports that are possibly loaded without the three combat units plus any number of leaders. So it can get it can get to be uh, quite a few units in the hex, as we can see here. Uh, we have a truck with a, um, a grenadier unit inside it, a truck with a grenadier unit, a truck, and basically any unit that's inside its carrying um, unit, so the grenadiers inside the trucks uh, only count as one truck. They don't count as a grenadier unit for stacking purposes. So you can get, uh, you can get three grenadiers inside of three trucks and those three trucks can load right up into a hex that have three other uh, combat units. 
Now, there is an issue like when you do this, if uh, the trucks get hit or damaged and the units have to unload, then the units will have to basically move over into a different hex um, if that happens, if that situation happens. If you move in and you become overstacked because the truck becomes uh, disrupted or demoralized, if a truck or any kind of transport unit becomes demoralized then uh, or disrupted, the unit that it's carrying automatically unloads immediately. It takes the same status as the truck. So if the truck here in this case becomes, say, we'll say demoralized, then the unit was carrying becomes demoralized and automatically unloads. If it over, uh, overstacks the hex, then that unit must retreat back to a different adjacent hex. And that is, um, you know, that can cause lots of issues there if you cannot unload into an adjacent hex and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's how transports work and stacking works. And, of course, any number of leaders, because, you know, they're just individual foot units, basically. So you can have, you know, 20 of them, 20 leaders stacked up in a hex. Not that you would probably want to do that, but you could if you wanted to. If you had 20 leaders in your scenario, you could put them all in one hex, which would be a little crazy. All right, so we talked last time about activations. We're going to go over that because it's super, 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 super important that you understand about activations and what you can do. So it's also important to know that I mentioned during our activations that leaders, these uh, counter leaders, right, uh, they can activate foot units. And that's not necessarily 100% true. Of course, they can do that, but they can also activate uh, trucks as well. So the only thing they can't actually activate are what they call armored fighting vehicles. You know, we're talking Stugs. We're basically talking tanks. Panther 4s, Stugs, um, Shermans, you know, stuff like that. So these guys can actually activate more than just the foot units um, they can activate the trucks the apcs as apcs are considered both a combat unit and a non-combat unit and that's basically the difference is these guys um, can activate um, foot units and non-combat units and the uh, tank or armored fighting vehicles can only activate other uh, combat AFV vehicles. So, um, I will, again, it's kind of a little bit confusing. That's why I wanted to go over it again. Uh, but, if I can find the part that actually explains it in the rules... I might be able to read it off to you, which might make a little bit more sense in my just rambling on here. For some reason, I can't get the proper words out, which always happens. Um, I think it's under section 11, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see. Mm. Or maybe not. Who knows? It's always where when you don't need it, you find it, right? Probably right where the section I was just in, but yeah. uh -huh. well, if I can't find it, then well, 
Oh, all right. Well, I guess we're going to move on because I can't find a damn thing. I'll probably see it you know, right after I'm done. I don't remember where it was because I remember reading it just a few minutes ago. Anywho's. It's kind of upsetting that I can't find it for you guys, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, I give up. <laughs> I give up. Oh, yeah, skip it and come back later. All right, AJ, I'll skip it and come back later. Thanks for joining us. All right, so uh, so basically just remember your AFVs can activate AFVs. Your foot uh, leaders, counter leaders here can activate anything that's not an AFV, basically. And an APC is considered both, so either one of them can. So we're going to just assume, again... Some nationalities automatically have armored fighting vehicle leaders um, with their units, of course, as they don't have a counter. We already talked last episode that the Germans uh, uh, always come with armored fighting vehicle leaders. They just don't have a, a counter for it. And the Americans are the same way if it's a scenario after 1944. Or starting in 1944. So we're just going to assume this is a scenario from 1944. So the Americans, each one of their counters also has a leader automatically built into it. Same thing for the Germans. They automatically have a leader counter built into each one of their tank or AFV counters. All right. So when we go to activate again, we can activate a stack. So we don't need to have a leader in the hex at all. We can activate this hex down here at 0513, which has got a 75 millimeter IG anti tank weapon and anti personnel weapon and a heavy machine gun. So we can activate this stack. We can activate just the heavy machine gun if we wanted to for an activation. Or we can activate just the 75 millimeter. Or because they're stacked in the same hex, you do not need a leader. To activate a stack and a hex. They can be um, like th this unit over here. We can activate all of these units because they're in the stack. So the two the grenadier, the 81 millimeter mortar, and the Stug G4 can all activate because they're in the same hex. Now what they can do is based upon whether or not they were activated by a leader or not. So the Stug 4 automatically has a leader counter in it. So it can decide to move closer to an enemy unit that can harm it. The 81 millimeter mortar and the grenadier unit were not activated by a leader, so they cannot move closer to enemy units that could harm it. So we talked about that in last episode, and of course that means uh, if I had... Um, a AFV and just a uh, grenadier. Let's say the let's say there's no other unit on the whole map, right? Except for these two units. This AFV, whether he's activated by a leader or not, can always go towards this guy because this guy can't hurt him, right? Because he doesn't have an anti-tank value on his on his counter. So if this tank was back here and it was activated by itself without a leader. Let's say this scenario was 1942 or 43 for whatever reason, and they didn't automatically have a leader counter. He could still move towards them because he can't actually harm this unit here. So, um, so that's important to, to know. So, uh, let's see. Did I put that guy back? Yeah. Okay. So, so of course you can activate his stack, right? So we act. We talked about that last time. So it doesn't matter what's in the stack, whether it's uh, uh, direct fire units, AFVs, bombardment units, whatever. As long as they're in the same hex as an activation, I can say, okay, I'm activating everything in this hex right here. Boom. 
But again, depending on what uh, what the unit is, they may or may not be able to advance towards enemy units. So that grenadier that's in that unit could not advance towards the uh, Americans because there's a heavy machine gun over here that can see him, has line of sight to him, and he would damage him. So since he wasn't activated by a leader, he couldn't advance towards the Americans. So another thing uh, we kind of showed with the counters, but it's a little easier in Vassal is I can activate this stack right here in 0309. And when I activate this stack, it has a lieutenant, a good order lieutenant in it. And we remember from last episode that a good order lieutenant can activate itself and any unit in an adjacent hex to it that's not an armored fighting vehicle. So when I activate this hex right here, the lieutenant can activate everyone that's an adjacent hex to him that's not an AFV. So he can activate all of these trucks. And obviously, since the grenadiers are loaded inside the trucks, they automatically go with the trucks unless they're unloaded ahead of time. But when we activate this stack, again, we didn't activate the lieutenant. We activated this stack. So when we activate this stack, the lieutenant activates. And when the lieutenant activates, he can activate all any unit that's adjacent to him that's not an AFV. So he can activate this stack of trucks. And he can activate these two grenadier units over here. Also, because this scenario, again, we talked about this. This is a 1944 scenario. German units... German AFV units automatically have a leader in it. So when the Stug G 3G activates, it has a leader in it. So that Stug can activate any armored fighting vehicle in an adjacent hex. So basically by activating this stack and activating the Lieutenant and the Stug, which are both leaders, one armored fighting vehicle leader, one normal leader, they can activate all the units in adjacent hexes. So, uh, one thing of note when we talked about, I'm going to pull out a couple more units here. All right, here we go. Uh, so, each German unit, AFV, automatically has with it a leader counter. So, when this Stug activates, he can activate. Now, let's, uh, let's set it up like this. So if I activate this Stug here in 0610, right here, I activate this Stug because it has a leader. It can activate itself and any AFV and adjacent hexes. So it can activate this Stug, and it can activate this Stug. Now, with what we talked about last time with subordinate um, activation of leaders, where you can get your captain to activate your sergeants and everything with AFVs they are all assumed to be the same rank or the same level so you can't get subordinates um, activation so when this stug activates it activates this stug and this stug but when these stugs activate it doesn't activate anyone that's adjacent to them through subordinate so if I wanted to move all of these stugs if I wanted to activate them all in one activation I would have to activate this guy here in 0510 or this guy in 0511. And then because these three are adjacent to this guy or these three are adjacent to this guy, they automatically activate. But if I was to activate this guy in 0610, he can only activate these two units here. And there is no subordinate activation through leaderships with the armored fighting vehicle so just keep that in mind a little bit different than when your captain activates right your captain activates here in 0412 if i get it to pop up that would be awesome there we go so the captain activates and the grenadier unit he's going to activate these two units as well and these two units as well and he's going to activate this hex as well it activates the sergeant, 
The sergeant, being a subordinate to the captain, can then activate himself and all the units in adjacent hexes to him. So the sergeant will activate with the 81 millimeter mortar, and the sergeant will activate this grenadier unit right here. So through subordinate um, activation through leadership in Panzer Grenadier for the uh, the counter leaders. The AFVs can't do what we just did with the other counters because they're all considered the same, basically the same rank. They don't have any uh, subordinates to one another. Unless there's a scenario that gives you, um, you know, any kind of information about, okay, well, one of your tank leaders is a captain and another one is a sergeant, but I don't think they do that. But just in case, you know, there is maybe a scenario that does something like that. So just wanted to bring that out to everyone's attention. Uh, let's go ahead and delete these guys. So let's start talking about what we can do, right? So one of the things we talked about when we activate a stack, right? If I activate this guy in 0311, and this is why your uh, leaders are so important, is it cannot go towards an enemy unit that can hurt it, right? So we have this heavy machine gun up here in the hex. So if it activates by itself, it can't move towards this unit, right? So that's why keeping your leaders in good working order and keeping them well positioned on the battlefield tactically, you know, I can activate this sergeant and this mortar unit right here. And when I activate him, he can activate all the units in adjacent hexes because he's in good order. And then the, the grenadier unit can then move towards enemy units because he was activated by a leader. Whew. All right. So hopefully that's, uh, that uh, explains basically what we were showing you last time. Of course, the rules go for the American player as well. So, you know, if the captain activates here, with the two infantry, he can choose. Again, this is all up to you when you activate. If you activate the captain, you don't have to activate everyone with him. You don't have to activate adjacent units. It's all up to you, but you can activate them. Again, the Americans, if this is a scenario from 1944, Americans, uh, AFVs automatically have leaders. So when I activate this unit in 1010, the M4, he can activate himself and he can activate all AFVs in surrounding hexes. This M4 cannot activate the infantry unit. They don't work together, right? Uh, but he can activate this vehicle here in 1110. So that's how, that's how um, that works. All right, so how do we actually get some damage? So let's try some uh, some actual combat here, show you how combat works. So we're going to assume, uh, so let's talk about the leaders again. So the leaders here, this lieutenant in 0309, should pop up here in a second if I click on it. There we go. So that lieutenant has a morale of 9. It has a combat strength leadership of one that is the bottom left hand number and it has a morale modifier in the bottom right hand corner which is zero so what exactly does that mean so when this lieutenant activates he can activate himself because he's in good order all the units in his hex and all adjacent units that are not afvs so in this case we're going to assume for our activation this leader is going to activate himself, the grenadier that's with him, all of these um, trucks in hex 0209, and these two grenadier units. And what we're, we're going to have to tell our, uh, our opponent is what we're actually going to do. We only have to tell them whether they're going to move or whether they're going to fire. Again, we do not need to tell them where we're moving to, who the units are firing at, 
or anything like that. All we have to say is, okay, I'm activating all of these units except for the armored fighting vehicle. And I'm going to activate these units here. And I'm going to activate these units here. And these units in 0209 are going to move. And these units here in 0308 and 0309, these guys are going to fire. All right. So uh, let's talk about fire groups. So I'm going to move these guys out for just a second here. We'll move them right back. But anytime you activate units in a hex, uh, that's kind of a... I'm going to actually move the vehicle out so it's not confusing. And I'm going to move this guy in. There we go. All right. That'll make it a little bit more easy. Oh, let's put the leader back on top. All right. There we go. All right. So anytime you activate a hex, it, doesn't, it can just be, uh, you know, like this out here by itself. Those units that activate with the leader can actively create a fire group, right? So those two grenadier units can shoot at somebody within range. We'll say this unit over here in 0910. And because they are stacked together. All right. The leaders have a special special little bonus that they have sometimes, depending on what kind of leader you get. But the combat value down in the bottom left-hand corner, in this case, is a 1 for this lieutenant, which means he can actually form a fire group <clears throat> with units in his hex and one adjacent hex as well. That's what the little one represents. So when these guy when this lieutenant activates and activates his grenadier units and also activates these grenadier units, he can create a fire group with these units and he can choose one adjacent hex to also add to that fire group. Now, you don't have to do this. It's up to you, but you can do that, right? Everything's kind of up to you as the player, but it's also based upon, like, what you want to do, um, what you want to do when you look at the actual chart. So let's look at, we haven't actually showed you this yet, but here is the direct fire table. So anytime... You're talking about units in black, right? Six and six. These are firepower. It's in black. That means it's going to be a direct fire attack. It's it's guys shooting bullets, right? So that's the direct fire table. What you're going to do is you're going to get your total value, and you're going to find the column that matches it but doesn't exceed it, right? So if we look at just this hex here, this has got a 6 and a 6, which is a 12 value, right? So if you look at our column here, it is all, there is no 12 column, so we're going to drop down to the 11 column. So once we go on the 11 column, we'll roll 2d12, and whatever number comes up there is going to be either a morale check, a morale check with 1, a morale check with 2, an X result, which means casualty reduction, okay? Uh, but if we add that because this lieutenant has a combat value of 1, we can actually take the other units as well. So they have a firepower of 12. These guys have a firepower of 12. That's 24 firepower. And then, as a combat bonus, the leader's 1, you can actually add that to one of the units as well. So the grenadier unit would actually be a 6 and a 7, which is 13. Plus 12 is 27. Wait, am I at that right? No, that would be 7 and 6 is 13. And 12 is 25. So we go to the 25. There is no 25 column. We go to the 22 column. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take our modifiers. And we're going to add or subtract not from the value, but from the columns. Right, so we're on the 22 column, and we will look and see if anything uh, applies to the effects. Now, notice, uh, let's see, can I highlight? I guess I can. Right here, right, right here is important part of the direct fire table. 
You can never lose more than two columns, and you can never go higher than three columns, right? So if we were on the seven column, right, for an example, we're on the seven column, and we got like a plus four modifier, we don't go to the 30 column. The highest we can ever go is plus three. And the lowest we can ever go is minus two when you add up all the different modifiers. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the direct fire table is the only one that has this restriction on it. Um, but we'll look at the other ones. So, minus two, target hex contains an entrenchment. Nope. Minus two, target hex is a town, woods, heavy woods, or jungle hex. So, let's look. Uh, this guy is in a town hex, right? So, we're going to lose two columns. Bloop, bloop. Because he's in a town Target occupied or is fired or at through one hex of light woods or light jungle. So are we shooting through light woods or light jungle? No, we're not. Target uh, unit is fired at through a hedgerow? Nope. If the target unit uh, smoke? Nope. Is he dug in? Nope. Higher elevation than us? Nope. Target occupies an 18 inch uh, mangrove, blah, blah, blah? Nope. He's in a swamp rice paddy. Nope. Is the target a mortar, an anti-aircraft, an anti-tank, a cavalry, or an LF, FLM unit? No. Is the artillery? No. Yeah, minus one target hex is fired on when the spotting range is one or two due to night? No. Is the target at three or more hexes away? Uh, let's see. We are shooting from here. One, two, three. We are shooting from here. One, two, three. So that would be another minus one. So we got a minus two because he's in the town and minus one because it is uh, three hexes away. Uh, is this opportunity fire? No, it's not. Uh, does it contain three combat units? Well, let's look. How many combat units are in here? Uh, nope. It only has a heavy machine gun, so only one unit. Um, is the target hex adjacent to all firing hexes? Nope. Uh, efficient firing unit moving or will move this turn. That's an optional rule. We're going to ignore these three optional rules for now. So you notice after all the modifiers, we've got a minus two for the town hex. And a minus one because it was three hexes away. So that is going to be a minus three. But again, remember, we can only lose two. So we're going to drop from the 22 column down to the 11 column. Can you take the uh, recyclables out? Not the recyclables, but the yard waste out tomorrow. Is it recyclable? The recycle I already did for the yard waste. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So because of this uh, restriction here on the direct fire table... We can only lose minus two columns. That's the most we can lose. So we're going to go from 22 down to 11. These um, modifiers are all cumulative, added, subtracted to one another, and then you're going to get a total result. So it's not like um, you lose two, and then you don't lose any more, and then say we get a plus because of something, and we go back up. No, you add up all these together, and if the total is minus three or, or more, then you just take it to minus two. Or if your total is four or higher, you just take it down to three. So uh, so we go from 22 down to 11 column. And again, we roll two six-sided dices to get our results. So that's what the combat modifier for your leaders does. You can see uh, our captain down here is also got a combat modifier of one so it could use one adjacent hex but notice this sergeant this is a badass sergeant right here he is a two two so he's gonna he can actually uh if we were to change things out real quick here without trying to confuse anybody uh let's put this up here like this there we go so this sergeant activated right he can activate himself and all the units adjacent to him that are not armored fighting vehicles. He can activate this hex here. He can activate all the trucks. 
and he can activate these hexes, and because he has a combat modifier of two, he can now take two adjacent hexes to form one huge fire group, right? So we could say the four from this 75 millimeter um, weapon and the nine from the heavy machine gun, that would be a total of 13. Then we have 12 from the grenadier, two from the sergeant. That is going to be a total of 14. And what do we say this one was? 14 and 13 is 27. 27 and 12. 27, 37, 30. So we would have a total of 39 firepower with these all of these units in right here in one massive fire group. And you can notice we get up over 30. The next column goes way up to 45. So you might want to not create, you know, you might want to split your uh, firepower best way possible so that you end up exactly on these columns without wasting firepower. You know what I mean? So, like, um, let's see if we can calculate something up to get exactly 30, right? So we should be able to with all these different numbers. Let's see. We got uh, 12... And 12 is 24. 5, 6, 6, 6, 7. Oh, okay, so I got it, right? So we got 12 firepower from the Grenadiers. We have 12 firepower from those Grenadiers. And we have 2 from the Sergeant, right? So that's 12 and 12 is 24, plus 2 from the Sergeant is 26. And then we add in the 75 millimeter for a grand total of exactly 30, right? So we're going to create one fire group that has that 30, and then the heavy machine gun can fire by himself instead of just wasting his firepower adding to this one total like that. Hey, Al Red Sex Fan, how you doing, buddy? So let's go ahead and uh, do that again. We end up with the 30 column. We lose two because he's in a town or hex, and he's also three spaces away. So uh, that is going to be a total of uh, 30. So let's roll two dice and see what we end up with. So 30, and we end up with a 9. So we look at the 9 column on the 30, and that's going to be an M2. So what happens here is we have to roll a morale check, right? And we're going to add 2 to the dice roll. So here's how morale checks work. This is another very important aspect of the game. So our lieutenant here has a morale of 9. He also has a morale modifier of 0. So he doesn't give his bonus. He doesn't have a bonus to give out in morale at all. He is more of a combat leader, as you can see there, unfortunately for the American. But, of course, uh, the lieutenant is stacked with a heavy machine gun, right? And you might think, well, why? That doesn't make much sense. You got this one leader with a heavy machine gun. But, again, if you go back to the chart, you notice there is an 11 column, right? An 11 column. So if this uh, lieutenant was not there, this heavy machine gun would shoot on the where's my game charts i think i minimized them what did i do with them damn it that's not it that's not it either game charts there we are all right so if the leader's not there he has a firepower 10 so he's going to drop down to the seven column but because that combat leader is there he gets to add his one point to that heavy machine gun and takes it up to the 11 column so that that is a difference in going from one column to the next column by having that leader there. So he might not be great at morale, but he is good for combat. And that's where using, you know, tactically trying to understand what, what works together really well and putting people in good positions and everything really can 
uh, tactically make or break your scenario. So we did an M2 attack. So first thing we always have to do is roll for the leaders. So the leader, we need to um, roll less than or equal to his morale, which is a 9. But remember, we got an M2 result, so we're going to add 2 to the nice roll. So if we roll it, we rolled a 5. 5 plus the 2 off of the chart. Right? It was an M2 result, so we add 2. So 5 plus 2 is a 7. So the tenant, nothing happened to him. Now, if he had a morale modifier, he could give it to his um, cohort here. But he doesn't have a morale modifier. So the uh, uh, again, you're going to get your you're going to get your morales based on your scenario. So we're going to say in this case, the American uh, I think we said in the beginning was a seven and a seven. So the uh, we're now going to roll for the heavy machine gun. I'm going to roll two dice. And he rolled a seven plus two because of the result on the game chart was an M2. So we add two to that takes it from seven to a nine. His morale is a 7, so he becomes disrupted. So we're going to mm, cycle morale. He is disrupted. So here's how disruption works and demoralized. If you fail your check by one or two points, you become disrupted. If you fail your morale check by three or more points, then you become demoralized. So because that was an M2 instead of an M, he became disrupted because he failed by two points. If he would have failed by three points, instead he would have been demoralized. All right. So that's how that happens. Now, if... Uh, let's go back to cycle morale. So this guy became disrupted. Okay. So we also have this heavy machine gun shooting. Remember, we made a group of 30. We also have a group of 9. And where's my charts? There we are. So we have a group of 9, which drops down to the 7 column. And then we looped 2 because he's in a town hex. Remember that? So... Seven, he's down to the two column, so we're going to roll on the two attack column. And we roll the four, which is pretty good. So we look at the two and the four, and that's an M check. So once again, all units in the hex have to make a morale check. All right. So the lieutenant first. He is a nine, so we're going to roll two dice. Oh, we rolled a 12 for the lieutenant. Oh, nilly. So his morale is a, it was a 9. He rolled a 12, which means he failed by 3. So he goes from uh, being full order right to demoralized. So he's been demoralized because all this firepower came in on him. He lived through it, and then the machine gun said, oh, no, you don't, and starts ripping into him, and he did not like that. So he, he's become demoralized. Now, we also need to roll morale an M check for this guy as well. He's disrupted. Oh, we rolled another 12. Holy cow. So uh, he has failed his morale check again by three and becomes demoralized. So in this case, if you're disrupted and you fail your morale check, you go to demoralized, right? So you cycle, you go to uh, demoralized. So both of these guys have become demoralized from our uh, attack, right? So we've activated, this is still all the same activation. Remember, we activated our sergeant, which activated these guys here, and activated our trucks, and activated this AFV, and we activated these guys. Now these guys all fired. And we also had these guys moving, right? So, let's see what we have left. One, two, three. See? So now what we can do is these guys can move. And they can go... Uh, wait a second. Now, 
If I move here, there could be some... Nope, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I'm going to be out of range from these guys. So nobody's going to be able to hit me. I'm going to be able to just move right there. Right? And so we look at opportunity fire from the Americans. But he doesn't have, he doesn't have the range, right? So he only has a range of three. One, two, three. So that costs one movement point. Now, there looks like there's a lot of units in there. But if you um, miss the intro on stacking, right? If you miss the intro on stacking, transport vehicles and APCs don't count for stacking until they... Um, until the units are forced out of their vehicles, and then the, then they will be if they are forced out of their vehicles. So uh, hopefully, Iterian hobbyist, what's going on, brother? Hey, I wanted to get with you. I'm glad you stopped in. Um, hopefully you're still there, but I wanted to get together with you sometime and uh, do a like a war game live stream. If you're up for that, let me know. Email me, ID Jester Live at gmail.com we'll get to talk about it and figure out a date and uh get on and talk some more gaming so so these guys are demoralized they would have been able to fight off all these guys but because they're not demoralized right these guys have moved here for second movement points and then third movement point and then for the fourth movement point these guys are going to unload so that costs a movement point for them. Yep. And then that's four, five, six. And these guys unloaded in that hex. So the trucks basically drove up, dropped their guys off, and then skedaddled the hell out of there. And then, of course, these units that fired... Right, they all get the fire marker. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Not at all. Let's try again. Uh, activation. There we go. So they. That's shift A. Okay, so shift A. It might be a little easier to do it this way. Shift A. There we go. And now let's highlight all these guys. They did a shift A. A and a shift A. And these guys did the shift A as well. There we go. So they're all marked with the fire marker. That'd be fun. All right, yeah, send me an email, idjesterlive at gmail.com, idjesterlive at gmail.com. We'll set up a time, a date, and we'll get on and talk some, uh, I'd like to hear your opinions on different wargaming, and i uh, like to make it like a regular series that we could do like a couple times a month if you got time for it. I'd like to get the OG on there and Maybe some uh, got some designers and developers that uh, might be able to come on as well. So should be a good time. If you're up for it, just email me and let me know, and then we'll uh, we'll schedule something. So that fire attack by the Germans worked perfectly, right? They got into position, right? Three hexes away. They ended up uh, disrupting a guy, and then their second attack, the heavy machine gun, which was not their big attack, right? It wasn't their big attack. Their big attack was on the 16 golem, right? Uh, actually, it should have been on the 16 column, but I put him on the 30 column. He should have lost two, two uh, steps from the target being in the hex. Instead of an M2, it should have been an M, but didn't matter. It wouldn't have changed the results. But then we had that little bitty two little bitty two from the heavy machine gun, which got a four and got that morale check. And then they proceeded to roll a 12 and then another 12, which demoralized both of them. Wow. So that was all. Uh, these guys are now moved, right? These uh, the, t the trucks here. I should probably mark those so I don't forget. These guys have all moved. There we go. And that was all in one activation. Right? So now you can kind of see how the activations work. So now it's up to the American player to take his activation. And what he's going to do 
Oh, boy, oh, boy. So you can roll separately for the machine gun. Yes, you can roll separately for every single unit if you wanted to... If you wanted to just, uh, you know, as as I mentioned, you activate your leader, you activate the units, and then you say which units are moving and which units are firing. If you wanted to fire every single unit by itself, you could do that. But of course, again, remember these guys are in buildings and such. So when you do that, um, oops. You're going to go down to a column where you need to roll a 2, 3, 11, or 12 to get a, just a morale check, right? Because even if you're on the 2 or 4 column, you're going to lose a couple columns because of the shift, because they're in a town hex, right? And also because they're shooting from 3 hexes away. Where's that one? Uh, if the target is 3 or more hexes away. So you're going to lose 3, but you, the most you can lose is minus 2. So you can take individual attacks, or you can create one big one. The advantage of creating one big one uh, is, you know, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, but you can get much better results. You can actually get casual reductions. You can force M1 and M2 results as opposed to just M checks. And now, you know, when these units are now demoralized, right? So what happens... The Americans, so let's go to the Americans' turn. So the Americans don't want to be demoralized anymore because being demoralized is super bad. Bad things are going to happen. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to rally themselves. So a tenant is going to try to rally himself from being demoralized. So that's what he is going to do. Now remember, we can only activate we can only activate the leader by himself because he's demoralized. Leaders that are in full good working order can activate themselves and all the units in adjacent hexes. Units that are uh, let's cycle the morale of this guy one more time. Units that are, are leaders that are disrupted can activate themselves and any units in their hex. And uh, leaders that are demoralized can only activate themselves. So a leader is going to try and activate himself for the American's activation. Right? So he has a morale of 9, but um, we're going to roll 2d6s. See, you have to roll lower than your morale. He rolled a 9, which is not lower than his morale, so he does not pass his morale check. So in this case, uh... Let me see. Does he have? Does he activate? Right. We're going to activate. We're going to activate all units in a hex. So we're going to activate all units in this hex. So remember, you can always activate a hex, right? So they're going to activate all the hex. The reason you want to do that is because if the leader passes his check then you can help out the dude that's with him but if he fails his check and this guy fails his check then they can kind of run together as they leave the scene so we're activating this hex for activation and we're actually activating as a move action the move action is basically to do a morale check so the lieutenant failed his morale check now it's up to the heavy machine gun the heavy machine gun rolls he rolls a seven. Now remember, on the scenario, uh, the scenario will give you a morale on the um, if you are in good working order or if you are reduced. So in this case, he's a good order unit. He is a seven, but you lose one to your morale when you are demoralized. So you're actually a six. So he also fails his morale check. So both of these units failed their morale check and when you're demoralized and you fail your, your morale check you do something what they call 
you hunt for a safe hex, right? So you hunt for a safe hex, which means you're trying to get away from the enemies that can spot you and do harm to you, right? So in this case, you've uh, actually, if we bring up the rule book, uh, uh, morale is. Uh, it's number 13 is what it is so if we look at all right bum, 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 bum. all right so so here's the bad things that happen with demoralized right when you're demoralized you may can you may not conduct any kind of fire except defending against assault and you defend against assault at one quarter your normal direct fire value, which is really bad. You have your morale reduced by one, and you must attempt to recover morale. So you cannot pass if you have any demoralized units that have not tried to recover. So you cannot pass. You have to attempt to recover for morale. If the unit fails to recover, it must flee. From enemy combat units that can spot it, are within range to attack it, and are capable of obtaining a combat result against it through direct fire or AT fire, including an assault. Uh, move the unit is marked for fire when it's finished fleeing. Fleeing! Each demoralized unit and leader that fails to recover must move away from enemy units that can hurt it. It must move towards the nearest, in terms of movement points, town woods, or other hex where enemy units can no longer spot it and fire on it with direct or AT tank fire, whichever could hurt the unit, and this is called its safe hex. It must spend its entire movement allowance moving away from the enemy to the closest safe hex. So if we zoom out on this map, you can see there is not a lot of terrain for the Americans to call, you know, there isn't like buildings back here in the back or anything. The best, the best is here or here is the question. I am going to say, hmm, this is kind of a tough call, right? It does say the, the closest safe hex. If there's two that are equal distance, blah, 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 right, right, right. So, I mean, technically the closest safe hex is this one here. So he is, they, these two units would exit out and move there. Although I think the American would try to get away from these guys and move away from them over to this town hex. But... Because it does say the closest, it must move towards the nearest, in terms of movement points, town, woods, or other hex, where enemy units can no longer spot it and fire on it. Well, I mean, they can still spot it. Some of them can. But anyways, we are going to put a... Where is it? Move. There we go. All right. Uh, so back to uh, AJ's question about the um, the you can roll for the heavy machine gun separately. Again, the sergeant activated activated those two grenadier units. He activated this seventy-five millimeter uh, AG gun. He activated the heavy machine gun, and he activated the two grenadier units. So all those units were activated, plus plus the trucks and the grenadier units that were in this hex. Again, because you have a good order unit, he can activate himself and all units that are adjacent to him that are not armored fighting vehicles. So he activated all those units. Because the sergeant has a two combat value, right, he can activate two hexes adjacent to him to create a fire group. So he chose this hex here and this hex here. 
when we added up the value, you got 12 from the two grenadier units there. You have 12 from the two grenadier units there. And then the sergeant gives one of those two units a bonus of two because that is his combat bonus. So that is a total of 14. So 12 and 14 is 26. We then looked at this over here and decided to add in the 75 millimeter for firepower factors into that, which would take it to 30. The reason we wanted to do that was to end up exactly on 30. So we are using this column. If we to were to add in the heavy machine gun to that attack, right? That would take it up to 39, which doesn't take us to another column. So it doesn't make sense to add that extra machine gun into that attack. So when you're when you're organizing your stacks of units, you want to try to activate them so that you end up as close to these numbers as possible so you're not wasting valuable extra points that are going for nothing. If you had two attacks that were 21 as opposed to three attacks that were 11, the three attacks that are 11 are much better than two attacks at 21, if that makes sense. Ah, uh, AJ. Hey, Clinton, how you doing? Good to see you. So, that's why we chose to not do the machine gun. Again, when you activate units, it's up to you as the, as the owning player. All you have to do is say which units are moving and which are firing. And then... It's up to you. You can move first. You can move one unit first. You can move another unit. You can see, you know, uh, you know, one of the uh, things that you know you like to people like to do at ASL is you throw that little half squad up until you know the enemy shoots at it, and then all of a sudden, you know, you can see the enemy unit, right? So you can you can do that where you move enemy units closer. <coughs> but it's all up to you how you design. Your fire attacks. We could just say, you know what? We're going to take those two grenadier units and the sergeant, and we're going to take a firepower of 14. See, that's not a great combo because we're wasting we're wasting some firepower in there because 14 doesn't doesn't get us to the 16 we need to get to. But we could do that if that's what we wanted to do. If we wanted to take an attack of we would have an attack of, uh, let's see, what's this? It would be an attack of 12, and it would be an attack of uh, 14, and it would be an attack of 13. So we could take all three of these attacks separately. But remember, this leader here has got a bonus of two, this sergeant, which is huge, right? Huge bonus. You look at the other leaders we have on the map. We have a captain down here that has a one. We have a lieutenant that has a one, right? And the American leaders uh, have a one and a one as well. So having this two leader, this is super powerful because without that two, right? If the sergeant wasn't there and we had, say, the lieutenant. Let's move the lieutenant up there. Oops, give me your lieutenant. All right. Now when we create fire groups, we can only create a fire group that has the units in its hex and only one adjacent hex. So we can only create a fire group with either this hex and our hex or this hex and our hex. So the best we could get out of that would be 14 and 13 would be 27. So yeah, see... We couldn't get to the 30 with this one leader. We could not get to that 30. The best we can do is 27 out of that. So we would be on the 22 column. And then we lose two columns because they're inside a building, so we're dropping down to the 11 column. So that's why, uh, you know, having these charts and 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 getting getting your numbers as close as possible. Remember when we looked originally at this heavy machine gun 
and the lieutenant and people were requesting well why do you have this lieutenant in with the heavy machine gun the reason we have this lieutenant in with the heavy machine gun is basically because of the chart the chart has a 11 golem right the heavy machine gun fires at 10 and the lieutenant gives you one extra firepower so that brings you up to 11 so that is a super powerful combo because that gets you to the 11 column with just those two units stacked together you don't need to add in another infantry unit if we add in an infantry unit all that's going to do is give us a firepower of 17 that 17 would take us up to the next column, but it's it's that infantry unit could be doing other things to make better combos. Like, uh, you know, this if this uh, was over here with this guy, right? Now we have a firepower of 19 for that. So we make it up past the 16 column with these guys over here. Without this guy in that hex, right? It doesn't really matter because the captain has a combat value of one, which means he can activate himself and all the adjacent units that are not armored fighting vehicles. And since he has a one combat value, he can add in an adjacent hex into a fire attack. So we go from 13 up to 19 and add that guy in. And now if well, we got to assume there was somebody within three spaces. Say that guy was there. So now these guys here and these two hexes create a fire group. And they can attack this guy. Or we can just take the units here and shoot at him. And then this guy can shoot at him as well. You know, all kinds of different combos you can come up with for uh, attacking. All right, so one last thing. One, this is going to be a quickie because you know we've been going pretty long. But uh, you know, if you guys are war fan enthusiasts, thank you for joining me. But make sure you go check up Iterian Hobbyist and his channel. He's in the chat right now, or he was just a minute ago. So if you just click over his name, you'll see three little dots. And if you click on these three little dots, and you can get to. Um, uh, it'll say, one of the options will be to go to his channels. Go to his channel and subscribe if you're not a subscriber to him yet. He does a wonderful job. Awesome, awesome war gamer. And hopefully he'll be joining us for some awesome war game live stream uh, chats. And looking forward to that as well. So let's look at uh, let's look at armored fighting vehicles here. So um, it's now. Uh, the Germans had done their attack. The Americans activated these guys, failed their check, so they moved out, so it's back over to the German player. So the German player now is going to activate. And what is he going to activate? Uh, this should not have a move. Oh, yeah, it should. That's right. Uh, let's put this back over where it was. There we go. All right. So the German player is going to activate this Stug. Yeah, he'll activate this Stug right here. Uh, the Stug 3G. And in, since it's a German unit, it automatically has a leader counter, an, an AFV leader. So you can activate himself and all adjacent AFVs, but we do not have any adjacent AFVs, so it doesn't matter. You can see that's a mortar unit under there, and then that's just a grenadier. So when he activates, he basically just activates himself. But he does have a leader, which means he can move towards enemy units, but this unit is going to activate to fire. So down in the bottom right-hand corner in the red letters, orange background, you can see his firepower of 6, and he has a range of 8. So he is looking at shooting at this tank the M4 in 1010. Zero, one, zero, one, zero. That's the hex I'm looking at, 1010. One, zero, one, zero. So how does this, uh, how do you do AT attacks, right? They're pretty, actually pretty simple. Make sure you have line of sight, right? So we have line of sight, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, boom. He has a range of 8. You take your firepower, in this case the Stug G has a firepower of 6. Right, 
And then you subtract the armor value from your opponent. The M4 has an armor of 3. You get a total number. So 6 minus 3 is 3. Then you go to the simple little AT chart. It's pretty simple. What you're going to do is roll two dice, add or subtract your difference between your firepower and your armor. And if you get nine or less, nothing happens. If you roll 10 to 12, it's going to take a step loss and then take a morale check. If you roll 13 or higher, the target is eliminated. Of course, there's modifiers here. The one modifier we do have to worry about is you get a minus one if the target is more than five hexes from the fire. So I think we counted six hexes. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, six hexes away. So he's going to get a minus one. So the difference again, six, three. So he gets a plus three to his dice roll, but he gets a minus one to that from that uh, more than five hexes away. And pretty much everything else is not going to apply at this point. And you get, you know, there's only about 10 different options. You get to learn them pretty quickly. They're not that hard. So we're going to roll 2d6. We're going to add 2. Again, 6 minus 3 is 3, but we get a minus 1 because it's 5 hexes away. It's a long shot. You know, it's a long distance shot. So we need to... Add two to the dice roll. We have to be higher than nine, so we have to roll pretty high. Roll to seven. Seven plus two is nine. Nine is no effect. No effect. If we rolled one more, we would have done some damage to him. We would have taken a step loss and then had to have taken an M2 check result. Uh, this unit now is fired. Uh, cycle opportunity, no, cycle activation, there we go, I can't remember which one it is, there we go, so it's narked with the fired counter, and now it goes back to the American player, the American player says, well, screw you, one, two, three, four, five, six, we're shooting right back, M4 is going to shoot back at it, so six range, one, two, three, four, five, six, so the Stug is just in range, is a firepower of five, he is going to subtract four for armor. So he's going to end up with a plus one. And then we've already looked at the modifiers. The only modifier is, again, because we were shooting at long range here, five hexes. So he's going to get a minus one with the fire hex uh, for that. So he's going to basically get a plus zero to his shot, but he's going to take it anyways. Of course, he could choose to move instead, move up closer for next time. He can choose to um, you know, maybe shoot at something else, you know, move up or whatever. But in this situation, we're just assuming he's going to try and shoot back. He doesn't have to. And he rolls an 8. We know you have to roll higher than 9, so 8 plus 0 is 8. That doesn't do it, so he's marked as... Uh, he's marked as fired. And that will bring us to the end of our live stream. So, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we talked a little bit, again, kind of overviewing about activations and stuff, and what you can do for your activations, and blah, blah, blah. But now, we actually see how firing happens. Um... We did so, tried to get some uh, rallies there, but that didn't work out so well for the Americans, unfortunately. And we actually did some AT attacks. Of course, we'll get some bombardment attacks. They're pretty much the same way. Pretty much the same way. Um, your bombardment's just going to, you know, firepower and range. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He can try to bomb this guy here as long as he's got range to him, which... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, he's got range. So you just basically go to the bombard table. Look at your firepower of eight. Right? And then add and subtract your modifiers. Find out what your final column will be on. And then roll 2d6 and see what kind of results you can do on them. So that's pretty much that. Again, you can combine 
firepower if these guys were like this. Let's say we had these two guys, right? I can activate this stack as an activation. You can always activate everything in a stack as an activation, whether they're AFBs, leaders, heroes, whatever, trucks, APCs, engineer units, doesn't matter. You can always activate one thing in a, uh, one hex and ev activate everything inside it. So these guys here can actually form into a fire group because they're in the same hex. If they were in this opposite hexes, we would need a leader to activate them. The problem with the leader in this situation is the leader actually is with the mortar unit itself. So this lieutenant can activate. He can activate all units in adjacent hexes besides himself, except for armored fighting vehicles and anyone that's already have a counter on them. And since he's got a combat value of one, right? He can also create a fire group together. So these mortars here and these mortars here can join up together and have a firepower. 16 plus one for the leader is a 17. I'm not sure that's going to matter, but let's look at the chart again. 17, nope. 16 is good, though. We would adjust up and down based upon... If they're in a town or trench, if they're in blah, 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 if they're dug in, what kind of unit they are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think the only thing that's going to matter is uh, – no, actually, I don't think there is anything that's going to adjust it. This unit happens to just be out in the open here and – so we would have these units, and we would do an attack, right? So we roll a f 5 on the 16 column. A 5 is an M check. So the uh, full-strength American has got a 7 morale. He rolled another 12. Bad day for the Americans, as he has gone automatically right to just demoralized. So he's been demoralized. Now notice we cannot add this guy to this attack because the lieutenant can only stack one adjacent hex, right? Unlike this other sergeant who had two. And then you'll have leaders, right? If we look at the actual uh, random, uh, where are they? Here they are. Uh, so here's your, you know, some different leaders here for you. Um, no, wait a minute. Want the yeah, here we are. Here we are. All right. So you see, leaders come in all kinds of varieties. Uh, so you have, you know, your lieutenants. There is a lieutenant, which is a 900, right? So he doesn't give any bonuses. And on the back side, he's an 810. And remember, when you draw leaders out, you randomly flip, flip it to find out which side counter you're going to use so you got you know nine zero zeros you you know here's a lieutenant b that's a nine one zero nine zero one nine zero zero so getting really good leaders with high qualities is going to make your um it's going to make your you know obviously make it a little bit easier for you because you can do a lot more with the leaders we haven't, you know, we have leader, uh, let's see if we can grab a leader that is, um, let's grab this lieutenant, right? If we can, can we flip them over? Uh, leader, no. I want other leader, there we go. So if this leader, right, this leader is given a bonus of two to any morale checks or any rally attempts, right? So if, for example, uh, Instead of this captain here, let's just delete this guy. Delete him. There we go. So instead, uh, this lieutenant was over here with these guys, right? And these guys started breaking, right? So, uh, you know, start getting disrupted. This guy becomes disrupted. Uh, where is he? There we are, right? This leader is going to add two to their morale. 
So when they try to recover, this leader is going to be able to give you much better recovery on units as well. So you're either going to get a 0, a 1, or a 2. Uh, and then the leaders come with different morales as well. 9s, 8s, 7s. Uh, pair that to, say, this guy here. I mean, there's a big difference between the, the quality of these two leaders and what you can do with them and how valuable they are, right? You want to keep this guy alive no matter what you what you have to do. You're going to protect him like he is a god because basically for your scenario, he is a god. Two to combat, one to morale is huge. It can make a big, big difference. Anyway, so that's, um, you know, we didn't, you know, really show that much, but hopefully uh, we'll have some more scenarios we, we actually didn't have any leaders out here. I'll try and create a couple more uh, test scenarios here that show you uh, more, you know, how important morale is. You can see how important morale is. You start breaking units and demoralizing them, and all of a sudden, you know, our units that were stuck here can move right up adjacent to them now and basically scare them out of that building. So if this is like a victory point hex, you know, Germans need to take over the three town hexes, Right, next turn, or next, yeah, next turn, you know, Germans get activated first, they can just walk right in there, boom, now they've got one of their objectives, just because they were demoralized, these guys, and sent them out of there. So that's how, that's what uh, Panzer Grenadier is about, is, is really demoralizing, disrupting your enemy, and then uh, using your units to get up there and... Uh, push the situation on them when they when they can't do anything about it because they're demoralized and disrupted disrupted units you know they fire at half firepower so if this guy here instead of demoralized if he was if he was uh, disrupted he's at half firepower so instead of a 10 column he's down to the five column right so that's going to be uh so instead of the eight he is going to be on, he's actually going to be okay because he's only on the five column. So he only drops one column, but that one column can make a big difference. If you roll a four or you roll a ten, right, it make a big difference. So disrupted units fire at half firepower. And leaders that are disrupted, uh, oops, uh, where are you? Um, cycle morale. So if we go to, right, Oh, better yet, let's do it over here. So if this sergeant was disrupted, right? Disrupted leaders can't activate anyone into Jason hexes, right? You can only activate units in your hex. So this this sergeant that's disrupted can't use his fire groups anymore because he can't activate those units anymore. He can only activate the units that are in his hex. So instead of activating everybody around him, right? So that's how important disruption is. If you can disrupt this guy, then this sergeant can't create those huge fire groups anymore. He can't do those 30 attacks on you, right? Instead, he's doing, he's only doing a 12 attack as opposed to a 30 and a 9. He's only doing a 12 attack because he disrupted him. So that's why, okay, now that this guy's disrupted, now's our chance to attack him. You know, then as the Americans, you might want to move up and, you know, attack him because he's he, he's disrupted. So that's where uh, Panzer Grenadier really kind of shines is in, you know, you, you don't just, like some war games where you just go forward and you attack back and forth and you take your casualties and blah, blah, blah. And this game is more about Finding the weaknesses, disrupting and demoralizing your opponent, and then moving in on those units and causing gaps in his lines, causing those units to retreat away, you know, uh, to kind of um, fall away from the objectives because they're demoralized and disrupted. So, anyways. Hey, James, how you doing? Oh, wait again. Yes. Be sure to stop... Uh, uh, be sure to, um, yep, we're going to cancel or we're going to end right now. We covered a lot of good things, though, about disruption, morale, um, combat effectiveness, how to actually do attacks, how to, we did 
AT attacks. We did direct fire attacks. Um, we're almost at the point where we can actually just start a scenario. The reason I haven't started a scenario because I didn't want to start a scenario and have to explain things that hadn't come up yet. And then it kind of takes the flow of the scenario away. You know what I mean? So probably another episode covering some of the other stuff. And then uh, hopefully then we'll actually start a scenario where you can actually see the game flow and the game play. All right. So James, Iterian Hobbyist, AJ, uh, Clinton Parks, Al Red Sox fan, everyone that came out tonight, I do appreciate it. Hopefully you guys learned a few things. Hopefully you guys are enjoying. Uh, the. Hopefully you are enjoying this. Uh, Panzer Grenadier, very nice, pretty good system. You know, um, it's I think well balanced. I think it's well uh, designed. I don't think a lot of people. The people that don't like it for whatever reason uh, usually are not playing it as a the way it was designed to be made. Where you're, like I said, you're not trying. Of course, you're trying to kill the enemy, but just as just as valuable as killing enemies are disrupting your opponent's leaders, disrupting his units, demoralizing these units are just as good as killing them. So a lot of people want to, you know, a lot of war gamers love to, oh, I killed this unit and that unit's removed from the map. And that's kind of, that's kind of war gaming thing, right? Is I killed this unit, it, flip it over and I, and then, you know, it's at its reduced side and then we hit it again and it's dead. And that's kind of the thing in, 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 um, Panzer Grenadier. Sure. You're going to kill units every once in a while, but you can see by the charts, right? You're going to have to. You have to get some really, you know, you have to roll twos and twelves, which doesn't come up very often, and tens and elevens to get some casualty reductions, right? But you're mostly going to be getting the M, M1, and M2s. And those are just as important or more important because, you know, just because I casually reduced you, uh, you know, now I can casually reduce you and cause you to be disrupted or demoralized or whatever. And now I can, now I can in, instill my will on you. Like just what we did with that scenario earlier. We, we broke these two guys here and then the trucks moved up and dropped off these grenadiers right here. And no one could do anything about it. No one could shoot at them because they were demoralized, right? These guys were out of range. So just by demoralizing these two guys, they were demoralized, by the way. Uh, they were demoralized. So these guys were demoralized. They couldn't do anything about it. So we just drove up, dropped off our Panzer Grenadiers. These guys failed their check and had to run away. And now these guys can move into that hex next turn. And it wasn't because we killed these units. It was because we basically broke their will to fight. And that's where Panzer Grenadier really, uh, really starts to shine. So anyways, I don't mean to ramble on, guys. I don't. But hopefully I'm just trying to explain some things because I'm sure people have questions afterwards. But all right. You all have a great evening. We'll see you all soon. James, Iterian Hobbies, AJ, Al Red Sox fan, Clinton Parks. God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Thanks for coming out.